The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We're like in the 60s and 50s that were like, you know, like good girls in jail, reform oh, yeah, school yeah. girls and stuff like that. Like, yeah. so when I was little, I was obsessed with that. I'm like, yeah, I want to be a bad girl. Oh, yeah, but, it's so fun. Al is going to love what I'm about to say. My mother loves those movies. That's her favorite thing. <laughs> she likes, yeah, women, women in prison. Like, and I, I guess they were more popular a while ago because she, she always laments. She's like, they don't do it anymore. It's like it doesn't, you know, there's no new ones. <laughs> yeah. I know. They, they, they should bring it back. I always feel like yeah, my favorite, yeah. people ask me, like, what's your favorite genre of, like, things to read or, or watch? And I'm always, I always say, like a bunch of friends do something terrible and accidentally kill a homeless person like in high school. <laughs> and then yeah, like yeah. 30 years later, they're all slowly being murdered by somebody like that, yeah, that yeah, very awesome. specific genre or like people are at private <laughs> school and accidentally they poison a classmate and yeah, you know, yeah. same thing, same <laughs> thing happens. Catches like, them, yeah. <laughs> catches up to them <laughs> the guilt. when they have like, yeah, the guilt and like all the women are day drinkers and they, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, they, they'd be cutters, but they're too lazy. <laughs> yeah, I feel like everything Jennifer's saying is like comedy gulp. Yeah, you are listening to the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, of course, and I'm I'm I run things. Believe it or not, not Al. <laughs> <Yeah. And, laughs> Eric Shapiro, he's the uh, Jewish laser beam guy. Right, right. Yeah, I told you, I told you if I was talking too much to tell me. You told me I should predominate, and then I often do, and I feel terrible after. No, but don't, you've got the, you've got me, the laser me. beams. I can't He's the you. power of the laser beams. Yeah, no, it's not about the laser beams. I'm happy. I, I, there's, <laughs> you know, I only do this because I really think you're funny, so I get on and I, I laugh for an hour. So he's don't he's me, got uh, the laser beams, but he can't help yeah. but get banned on Facebook. Oh, it's just something. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, I, yeah, I was thinking It's a conspiracy. Of, uh, he doesn't yeah, have yeah. <laughs> power, right? You, yeah. call, call George Soros. He's, he's, he's there to help. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, then, yeah, I guess I'm still banned. I'm going to have to put a photo up. Uh, I'll put something up today to see if I still am. I was getting like. I, you literally can have a nervous breakdown when it starts happening because I generally get pretty good engagement. But I was putting things up and it was like crickets. I was like, oh no, does everybody hate me? And I have been canceled a couple times. So I really start worrying. I start like searching my name on Twitter. I'm like, wait, what did I do? Like, and uh, I realized it was a, um, it was because I was making fun of Karen's, you know, women, like, like, you know, women that call the manager. And I, I yeah. thought that was the most innocuous thing. And an actual Karen. Uh, has taken this up as a cause. I won't say her last name because I'm not that mean. But she's taken but this up as a... is her first name Karen? Is her real her first name, name is actual Karen. Her parents named her Karen. And I feel terrible that that happened. I mean, I always, whenever I make fun of Karens, I always do worry about real Karens. I'm, it's not like I'm some mean bastard, but, you know, on the other hand, mm. we're not going to stop using this word. It's just become a y cultural yeah. thing, you know? So it is a cultural thing. It's not my fault. Thing. It, it, it very much so, is. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I have a friend whose name is Karen, and I, I feel bad because I've made fun of Karens to her. And, like, you can see, like, yeah. a little bit, like, she, like, winces a little. Like, yeah, just, I, like, yeah, how could you like, blame them? How could you blame them? Yeah. Like, I oh, sprayed, like, salt water in her eyes. That's She's my like, drag Ooh. name. My drag name's Karen, and it doesn't bother me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you started that after the, the, the nickname started. Yeah, actually, yeah. I think it, it <laughs> gives, gives me more hits. Hashtag, yeah. hashtag Karen. Yeah. Well, um, yes, they they shadow down me, but it's okay. I mean, more. All I have to do is come on this show, the more people hear my voice. It makes no difference. You're, I'll be canceled then. No. Yeah, I know. I know. You, you're gonna, you'll, you'll by association. I was gonna yeah. say we're gonna catch it like it's a virus. Yeah, yeah it's still, what gonna, I, It's terrible. You're I mean, gonna drag wanna, us down. I'm already. Mm -hmm. I said I wouldn't predominate, so I'm not gonna tell my war stories. But I've been called uh, for no reason, mind you. I, I have to tell you. I just trust. Trust me when I tell you, there was no reason. It was just that I was, like, slightly outside of the progressive hold on an opinion. Because I write opinion editorials, and I've been called uh, racist, sexist, sexist, and fascist. And it's, uh, it's so disturbing when it happens. I told Al, like, what it does to your mental health. Like, uh, they just people calling you a piece of crap, and uh, yeah, I can't sleep. And it hasn't happened in a while, though, so. Yeah. Well, I'll get on Because that. you're meditating now. He's yeah. a man. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of like, yeah, I'm protecting myself. He meditates in his robe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah he's, 
<laughs> well, and now uh, the other voice is uh, Karen. No, it's uh, right. Oh, God. Oh, Jennifer and <laughs> right. So what? Hey. My God. Um, Hi. So now that you're um, an A-list celebrity star. Oh, gosh, yes, no. yes. I mean, my no. God. And now you've got a new book coming out. It's not out yet, right? When no. You- um, it is called Pretty Ugly, and it comes out July 13th. And, uh, and am I am I talking about it now? Am I doing my well, thing? Well, I, I just like, I, oh, I, I, well, a little yeah. bit. I'm interested. You call it pretty ugly, so I don't remember getting any royalty checks for using my name. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's uh, so. What's the, what's this with the name? The title in itself is not so, so um, correct, right? No, it's not. But it, it does make sense. It's a, a story about two people, really. Uh, an uh, Instagram influencer who uh, does makeup tutorials based on vintage books. And she kind of lives this very fictitious life. And she is all about how she looks and how she presents herself because she suffered from a childhood trauma. So she's reinvented herself as uh, an influencer. And her name is Omelia and everybody loves her. And it also follows a politician who gets embroiled in a very minor level political scandal, but he is running for the governor of the state of Massachusetts. His father is the Republican vice president of the United States. Um, so the story follows these two people while uh, a virus breaks out. And this was pre-COVID when I came up with this, but my virus isn't our virus. It's kind of a mutation between herpes and meningitis like a bacterial meningitis so it makes your face like rot off <laughs> well oh wow oh, put, d- put so, down your yogurt <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's like i keep telling people i'm like you know show up for the body horror and stay for the possible rom-com that happens with the, when the world ends uh but yeah so that's why it's it's called pretty ugly because people do end up having to wear masks in the book the people who end up surviving the virus, but it's because they're hideously disfigured. Wow. Well, I love that you incorporated Instagram because I feel like I always <laughs> complain that authors aren't on time. Like, like social media is, doesn't exist in too many books. Like authors yeah. don't know how to, how to integrate or handle it, but uh, also cell phones in a lot of cases. But uh, that's, that's really cool that that's uh, a foundational element. Yeah. And this was the first time, even though like I've, I've written books that take place, in, you know, whatever, like, modern day is in, like, mm-hmm. fiction world. But this is the first time I've kind of concentrated on social media and people checking their phones and, you know, doing mm-hmm. stuff and getting, you know, quote-unquote canceled because you're caught on a hot mic. Like, it's all very, yeah. like, contemporary. It's, there's a lot of doom scrolling. And, um, and it, it was refreshing to be able to just, like, kind of talk about things that really happen to us, like... Mm-hmm. Where you know we get trapped and staring at Facebook for hours, and like it is part of who we are, and it, it makes sense for it to be part of who my characters are too. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's going to be a selling point for a lot of people because uh, yeah, the, the absence of it is almost creepy in a lot of books. It's like, wait, why aren't these people on their phones all day? You know, like it's yeah, just become exactly. a reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm working on a project right now that I can't really talk about but it's very 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 social media focused in a mm-hmm. dark way so oh it's it's been interesting to write in like chat room logs and text messages and mm-hmm. you know people just being very obsessed with their phones but, yeah but just this sort of theme when you write in this this style and you add these subjects like you know for instance the republican uh, vice president and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, it has to be addressed because in the sense that, it, you know, there's so much, I don't know what you want to call it, controversy. There's so much talk about politics as of late and uh, vice president and Republican. Does this sort of, d- do you worry about being canceled for that? <laughs> no, but, you know, um, the backlash, you know? You know, um not really. I feel like haters are going to hate no matter what. And I didn't, I don't want to say I didn't try to villainize my Republican vice president character in this book because he definitely is pseudo villainous at times. He's not likable, but 
I think I, I chalk it up more to like the father son dynamic and I don't talk about the politics as much though. I think if anybody who like knows me on social media or even in real life, they know that I'm incredibly liberal mm-hmm. and, and outspoken. And Oh, you're, so. you're not, I thought you were far right wing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I so want, I'm a QAnon Q. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, but that whole thing, like when you're trying to, um, you know, you've got a virus, you've got a little, the, the Republican in there, you got all this stuff, uh, you know, Instagram. So it's very to date. I just yes. wonder if it, how do you think people read into that? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how they will. You know, I've had uh, my beta readers liked it. I've gotten some really great, um, book blurbs from people like Wendy Webb and Sean Cosby. And, you know, none of them had said, none of them mentioned the, like the politicalness of it, but they, they all mentioned that like it, sometimes it felt too real because they read it, you know, while we were, we're still in this pandemic that we're in. So I think it's, I think more people will probably be upset that it's about a virus then they would be upset about the politicalness of it. Yeah. That makes sense. I feel like people are going to be like, oh, I don't want to read a book about a virus. And I'm going to be like, but it's not our virus. It's a different virus. And trust me, it's, it's different. And I'm sorry I wrote a book about a pandemic and it's coming out, you know, at the tail end of a pandemic. But my brain had to do it. It was in my head before COVID and I had to get it out. And Oh, wow. Like so you were, you were uh, precious. It was- it was prophetic in a way. And like, and I'm not I, saying that, uh, I'm not saying that fancifully because I do believe like, uh, not to get airy fairy, but sometimes you get like tapped on the shoulder with an idea and yeah. it's like, all right, this is what I'm uploading from the universe. Yeah. So the crazy thing happened. I believe in that stuff too. Um, okay. my first book that came out was called Beautiful, Frightening and Silent. And okay. I, uh, my, one of my characters has a very specific injury. He gets in a car wreck and his hip shatters and his femur shatters. So he has like a steel rod in his leg and he walks with a limp. And so as I was writing that book, I was maybe like in my second draft of it. My mom, who lives with Mm. us, fell down, shattered her hip and broke her femur. And she had to have the same surgery that my character did in the book. And I was like, "Uh, what did I manifest? And my husband always says, he's like, be careful with what you're writing. There's because. no person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, we, uh, I don't want to like. I, I promise not to predominate. We can, we can get like super bug out, airy fairy with all this. But yeah, we. I mean, I do think there's a holographic component to reality. So when you're writing, I think it's sort of a, a like self hypnosis, and you could, uh, you could start grafting what you're writing onto the grid, kind of. Yeah. So that's, no, that's I, I, yeah. I believe in that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's wild, but, yeah. It's like, oh it's, no. Oh, yeah. So, oh my so if you write, if you write about your husband, the husband in this story, and the wife taking out a huge insurance policy on his life, <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen. Oh. You got Yeah. Oh. I'm uh, yeah. Uh, I love poor, my husband too poor much. Poor Mr. Gordon. Yeah. Poor Mr. Yeah. Gordon. Oh, yeah. it's, he's not a Mr. Gordon. I didn't oh. take his last name. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Yeah. I no, it's okay. Last name. Yeah. No, because his first name is Roman, and then like none of the names work together. Like Roman Gordon. That's Roman Gordon. Oh, it flashes a little. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, what, is his, his, what is his last name? Are you his last say? name is I can say it's Seraton. It's Russian. So. Oh, okay. I, then I would be Jennifer Sirotin, and I feel like there's oh, too yeah, many that, hard yeah, that, R's. Don't sound right. You're right. It's like yeah. Jennifer well, Sirotin. I sound like Winona Ryder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So. I feel bad for you because I'm I'm Russian too. We're intense husbands to have. It's uh, <laughs> you, I'll put you in touch with my wife. You can you can trade <laughs> trade notes. I, yeah. You know, yeah. I've gotten used to it. We've been together for we've only been married since Halloween, but we have oh. been together for uh, t- eleven years, ten years. Oh wow. Oh, congratulations on the recent on the recent marriage. So you got married uh, mid pandemic. Yes, we wow. did. Like we we eloped. We, okay. We knew we wa- we wanted to get married on Halloween because it was a full moon. It was a Saturday. It was the perfect date. But then the pandemic came and happened to us all, and we were just like, well, we can't have a wedding, and that's fine. 
but then we still, we, we went back and forth for a while, but we ended up just deciding to do it. We stayed in a bed and breakfast that was haunted. We were the only guests oh, nice. there. So it was really um, a, a, a nice two day getaway mid pandemic. Oh, wow. <laughs> Unforgettable. Yeah. 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 I, I feel, you know, um, I'm a fun, uh, enjoyable husband, but as a Russian, I, I just have uh, trouble relaxing or, or enjoying oh, myself. That's my whole yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything yeah, is always no. very severe and, and, and uh, dark, yeah. <laughs> I understand yeah. that. I yeah. understand that. I'm like, just yeah. relax. Just yeah, relax. Yeah, it's impossible. Calm yourself. It's always then... a, a sub-zero winter of the soul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, are you, are your parents, were you, were you born in Russia? Were your parents born in Russia? Uh, it's all my, my grandparents. So I'm Russian, okay. Polish, and German, but most of, uh, most of uh, my ancestors are Russian. Yeah. Yeah, I you know I always wanted to be Russian because like growing up like during the Cold War I was like kind of obsessed with Russia. Had the Russian yeah, Cabbage yeah. Patch Kid doll, like loved watching yeah, all the oh, Russian right. figure yeah. skaters. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Gosh, being Russian would be so cool. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so again, I think I manifested. So I married. Oh, that Russian. is a manifestation. Oh, no, you're not yeah. kidding. Like, my wife. Because I'm uh, Jewish, my wife is uh, black and Filipino, and we li- we now live in the town where she grew up, and we have the local newspaper here, and we're part of this community, which is predominantly Asian. It's 70% Asian. And she, her growing up here, she was obsessed with uh, Jewish people, and she never met one. Like, I'm, like, literally one of the only ones here now. Like, uh, she um, she loved Schindler's List. Like, she was very interested in the Holocaust, and the and then she, I feel she manifested me. So I totally believe in that stuff. Are you, are you a New Yorker? Or you sound like an East Coaster. Where are you? I am an East Coaster. I'm in New okay. Hampshire. You're in New, New Hampshire. Hampshire. So, but okay. like 45 minutes from Boston. But I, okay. most people, when they meet me either online or in real life, assume I'm Jewish and from New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I'm, I'm from New Jersey myself. Yeah, it's, okay. You are, I'm, and people go, but like in a nice way. You seem like you're from Jersey, but in a good way. And I'm like, right. what? what does that even mean? I'll tell you, having gr- having grown up in Jersey, we didn't get. We were so made fun of growing up. Like it was always a punchline. Like what exit? Or like you know, we're all trash and all this stuff. I have to tell you, uh, or it could just be a perceptual thing. When the Sopranos took over the world. Like, I felt like it upped our, uh, our, uh, stock, our credibility yeah. so much. Like, suddenly we became, like, anthropologically fascinating. Like, uh, and that show so accurately captures us. But it's so interesting because I never thought of it consciously. It was always subterranean. But, uh, because we've been Facebook friends for about a year, I was absolutely, uh, operating under, under the assumption that you were a Jewish New Yorker. And I, yeah. and I'm, I'm <laughs> almost slightly surprised that you're not. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. everybody, everybody thinks I am. I, for a wow, little while, yeah. I worked at an art gallery in New Hampshire, okay. and okay. everybody that I worked with was Jewish, yeah. except for me. And I remember, um, and like one time the rabbi came in, and he was just like, I haven't seen you in Temple in a long time. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I, I, I've never been to Temple. And yeah. he was just like, I know who, like he thought I was the, the owner of the gallery's daughter, who was also okay. named Jennifer. But I'm like, no, I'm not. Jewish, and I had to like yeah. convince the rabbi that I wasn't Jewish, <laughs> and then he was like, well, well, yeah, you, yeah, should, that's very you should still come to temple, and I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, you, you're like more <laughs> Jewish than Jewish people, yeah. yeah, I'm definitely more Jewish than my Jewish husband, yeah, oh, yeah, no, no, I believe it, I believe it, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's we should, I mean, and we should all be like, just like proud of who we are and like where we came from, like, I, I, grew, yeah. I grew up like really, really, really self-conscious of everything, I was because I grew up poor in a rich town. Okay. Like I was okay, like, yeah. like right on the outskirts of the town and there's like this little tiny house. And, you know, I wore the same clothes a lot and I, I switched to a, I was in a private Catholic school, but then I switched to a public school and the kids there were freaking monsters. You know, they, they saw me as like weird and poor. Mm. And I was just like constantly made fun of for everything I was. So, mm. like, you know, you go through life, and it's hard to let that stuff go. Like, Yeah, it is. It know? really is. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that is, it is fascinating. It, it imprints itself on you. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah. like, you get to be an adult, and you're just like, well, I wasted so much energy, like, being paranoid and, and scared to just be me. 
and yeah, you're so right, and it's it's such a gift when you finally relax about it. I mean, um, yeah, I think I think with me it was so subterranean because I always was thought to be Italian, and I loved you know the Godfather and Goodfellas, so like I was like, oh, it's cool to be Italian. So <laughs> I'm just gonna go with it, and that, it took me years and years to unpeel that onion and be like, whoa. In the course of doing that and embracing that, I was denying something else that's profoundly important and profoundly. Uh, you know, a, a profoundly positive part of my identity. I'm very interested. Like when you guys are talking about the Jewish and all this stuff, I'm so interested in hearing what the culture's like, what you do in your life, what 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 a Jewish person is or does. Yeah. But it's not about um, because I dislike them. Oh, they're enemies. It's because, oh yeah, otherness. Or, yeah. yeah. It's like well, what is it that it? What is a Jew? Like what does that mean? You know. And yeah. so for me, that's very really interesting. Um, so I don't understand why people hate because of the differences, because I think that we need each other in order to progress further, you know. Uh, there's so many things that we can each do that contribute to a, a better place to live. So I just, it just is bizarre to me. Well, I, I just wish more people, like, thought like that instead of, like, being fearful of things that are other than them. Like, you know, and I think this is also why, Alan, you're, like, such a great interviewer because you have a natural curiosity of like just mm -hmm. I am I'm very curious that what is your life like and there's a genuineness there right that you, you like some people will like ask you questions and you can tell that they're not even listening and they don't care <laughs> but, <laughs> you know so, so it's no, and, 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 well you've got to ask more about the person as well uh, because you are everything you do so when you are putting out a book or you're putting out a movie or whatever is happening in your life I, it's better to go deep into that person to find out who they are as a person and what makes them tick because that that's going to explain the book even better than them telling me the characters you know yes yeah I, I think you're right I, I also when I buy a book um, and this is also even just talking to Jennifer now makes me uh, now I've always wanted to read your work Jennifer but now it's it's more it's more acute than ever. It's. I think uh, you are buying the author when you're buying a book. You are. I, I think. Yeah. You you're are. buying the attitude, and, the personality. Yeah. And I feel like I think like it's like that with all of the arts, really. Like even if it's a painting, or or yeah. you know, a music. Like I want to buy the part of that artist's soul. I want to like. Yeah. So I always say like if if I like the artist, I'll probably like the art. But if I meet the artist and the artist is a total you know, jackass, I'm not going to buy the book. Or even if I did like the book before, it's going to be tainted a little bit. Like, But do you think that's a problem? You know, because that's going on a lot right now, you know, where people all of a sudden, oh, uh, Woody Allen did this. And so what they used to uh, call the best yeah. movie maker in the world is all of a sudden trash. And it's so like, does I, it really change? Um, it changes who you think of that person, like, you know, maybe. But you, like, you can separate the art from the artist. So the other night, for the first time in years, my husband and I watched a Kevin Spacey movie. Oh, okay, yeah. And I was like, am I going to be able to look at him and still appreciate his performance? And I could. Yeah. I could. Like, I was just like, well, you know, so. But I think I wouldn't actively support Somebody that I didn't respect. Right, it's not like, like he'd be a like, cheerleader. It's a, that's yeah. a tricky one. Like, and Kevin Spacey is such a good example because I think he's one of the most talented people that was canceled. Like, he's a yeah. legitimately powerful artist. Um, and it's interesting because I, I felt with that, I haven't, I don't think I've sat through something, but I've caught things like, and I, I remember I caught his whole section of seven. I'm like, this is better now because of what he did, which is a, which yeah. is a, you know, a, a taboo thing to say, but. And then American Beauty, on the other hand, where he plays a person of more character, I felt like I, I caught a big strand of that, too, and watched it for like an hour. And he's magnificent. But it was I found it slightly distracting. Yeah. So I yeah. we watched Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And oh, he plays amazing. he plays a jerk in that. So it was like yeah. really easy to just be like, that's fine. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. what's funny is Seven was the movie that, like, you know, we were talking about. I was just like, how I'm like, we can't give up Kevin Spacey completely because I never, like, I don't want to never watch Seven again. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's like, the, and that's it's why. Like, um, I'm going to have to at some point in time watch The Usual Suspects again because I want to. Oh, uh, exactly. You, you said, I, I couldn't agree more. It's interesting because, uh, yeah, there are certain people that say, oh, cancel culture doesn't exist. But I think what they're, not, I mean, not only do I disagree with that, but uh, in addition, the word 
the word cancel is being used ironically to an extent because you can't you can't just delete somebody. It's not possible. Yeah, so like J.K. Like, Rowling yeah. is still going to be J.K. Rowling. Like, yeah, it doesn't totally. matter. Absolutely. Like, I think in, in her case, also, she's picking up a lot of new fans, like, that are more apolitical yeah. or moderate or right-leaning. Like, so I think she, she her appeal, if, if at all possible, is broadened in a way that the people that have, uh, that, that have an issue with her don't realize. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. Because, and, and, you know, and a lot of people are just like, well, even though I don't like her, I'm not going to stop loving Harry Potter. But now, no question, yeah, people. what can you do? Yeah, yeah, you can't stop. But now, like you said, she has people who probably never read Harry Potter, but might agree with her politically and be like, you know, I should check those books out. So it's, exactly, yeah, yeah. I just wonder how much this this means. But like in 200 years, does it mean anything? Because none of us are yeah. alive. Nobody was alive when Kevin Spacey was out. So in 200 years, when someone watches it, they won't have that preoccupation. Right, and if they, it, it, you're right. It definitely won't be a preoccupation. If anything, in the history books, it would be an asterisk, a footnote, and, and it's like it becomes fascinating. It's like, uh, um, I can't even remember. There was a comedian, what was it, um, uh, Fatty Arbuckle? Like, did, is that who that was from, like, uh, like the old, old movie era, like he killed somebody? Oh, yeah. yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, that's me because it's so long ago, and that, that's a whole other uh, point also that Al's making in terms of as time goes by, like, it's robbed of its emotion, so it's like it becomes a point of fascination. fascination. It's like, oh, that artist did something grisly, and that makes it, maybe that'll draw you to checking out the art, or maybe you'll stay away, but it's not like this alarmist thing that we have in the present time. Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. nobody cares when they watch an old Joan Crawford movie that she is right. like a terrible monster. Like, I'll watch right. whatever happened to Baby Jane forever. Like, please, yeah. I, right. it doesn't matter if you... <laughs> well, I, think in, I think in time it's not going to matter. I think it, it yeah. fades away and, and the art is left and then the new generations won't really, they won't be in touch with it and, and it won't matter as much, if that makes sense. I think. It does make mm -hmm. sense. What did you, what was the point of writing it? Like, what did, did, did you have a theme when you were writing this? Um, you know, my, my theme originally started as what would happen to people who are based their entire life on being a fictitious version of themselves, and then they can't be that version of themselves anymore because they become disfigured. Mm. But then throughout the writing of it, it, it really became kind of a, like a journey of figuring out who you really are. So both my main characters, each, you know, they don't know each other, but each of them have like a very severe loss in their childhood. And it's that moment that kind of shapes them into, I, I'll just be a different person. I'll be a fictitious version of myself and then nobody can hurt me. So it, you know, thematically it was about the world ending, but not just, the world in general ending, but like their world, their fictitious world has ended. And the only thing they have left is actually who they really are. And it's uh -huh. about reconciling who you really are. Are you pretty? Are you ugly? Are you both? Do you, you know, are you destined to be alone because you can't love yourself? And so, and it's, you know, it's a story about connecting with family, and, um, understanding who and what family actually is, especially when you don't have a family. Like, so, yeah. It's, wow. so, so, I mean, so it's, um, parts of it are very, very beautiful. It's just like, it's very much like a lament on, on life an unlived life and how to maybe find happiness when there's honestly like no happiness to be found. So it's about that. It's uh, very timely. I think uh, uh, so many of us can relate to the, the themes in terms of uh, the social media avatar versus the actual person and uh, navigating reality. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, wonder, I hope. <laughs> well, and I wonder if if um, if it's not something that we all have anyway. You know, like uh, you know, the, when we dress and do our hair and do our things uh, to present ourselves in public, isn't that sort of a an image that's that's not really ourselves? Oh, it definitely is. I mean, and this comes back to, you know, what I was saying earlier, like I was picked on in school. I had really, 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 really terrible skin growing up. And my skin's still not awesome. But I 
wear makeup every single day, even if I don't leave the house. Like mm. I, I, because that's part of who I am. Like the kind of the, I guess like the fictitious version of me, I wear makeup. I won't even go to the mailbox without makeup. Like I, there was a time a few years ago, I was really sick and had to go to the emergency room and I was putting on my makeup before I left. And my husband was like, you're probably dying right now. Let's just get you into the mm-hmm. car and bring you to the hospital. Um, and I was like, no, I just have to put on my makeup because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, because yeah. I have to. Like, I need to be wearing lipstick, even though, you know, I was, you know, very close to death. Wow. Wow. Like, <laughs> Eric's sort of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric very needs close his to death. Very close, needs to death. Very close yeah. to death. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in big trouble, guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's really interesting, that, that factor of um, the image that we portray and then what's what's underneath it and being scared to, to let it out. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. So how did you find it? How did you how do you decide what to do with your character and something like that? Like what, what, what exactly were you going to pick out as a um, hidden thing other than the disfigurement, of course? Oh, of um, you know, I'm such a pantser that I really just, it, it just kind of happens as I'm writing. Like I just discover things as I'm writing the characters. I get, I'm getting to know them. Like this is my first draft is me just telling the story to myself and and the characters telling the story to me. So that sometimes I'm writing in, you know, a little like I'm in their head with them and I it's like I can see their memories, their childhood memories. Like it, it's not a spoiler because it's just such a, a minor part in the book. Um my main character, my main female character, she goes by the name of Omelia, her real name's Nicole. Um, but she as I was writing it, I just like have this like memory of her eating raw meat when she was a little kid and getting really sick and her father putting a cool cloth on the back of her neck and like rubbing her back and to her that was like the only time she ever really felt loved her her father then like he ends up killing himself later on in her life but like that's that defining moment of what love is to her and that's just something that like popped into my head of like Mm. This is what this broken girl woman Mm -hmm. thinks of is like, I just, that's what she, what she wants most in the world is somebody to like put a cool cloth on the back of her neck and rub her back. Mm -hmm. Is it in the uh, first person or third person? Third person. Okay. Do, do, but when you take a a character, where does someone like that come from for you? Like that, that character, um, is that something out of yourself, your own life, or is that something that um, just comes to you? It, I think it's both. I feel like there's aspects of all of the, my characters, even the terrible ones that are that are me. Like I'm, I, bad parts of me are are woven into <laughs> my character someplace. The good mm-hmm. parts of me are mm-hmm. too. Um, a lot of the writing for Pretty Ugly actually came about I've been taking these um these weekly grief writing classes like um mm. exploring grief through multiple different ways of writing and because I, I write a lot about grief in my horror and a lot of this book actually came about because I would attend these grief writing sessions and I would just like put myself in my character's headspace and explore my own true life grief in like through my character's voice, if that made sense. So like I would just like do these free writes and a, and a lot of my discoveries of who these characters were, even the, the male character, uh, Sam, kind of came about through grief writing prompts and, and things. And a lot of it didn't make it into the book, but some of it did. And some very personal things that have to do with my life wove themselves into the book. But every book I've... I've written, I think there's personal parts of me in there. Does that, does that worry you when you expose yourself like that? Um, no, no, it doesn't. Cause I feel like, like I'm, I'm, I'm an emotional person. And I think being a performer for so long, I went to school for theater and then I was a professional dancer until COVID. Um, 
I just, I've always think I've been strongest artistically in any way, shape or form when I'm like exposed emotionally, like, mm. like I'll, I'll write from the wound. Uh, I, I don't, I don't need to write from the scar. I don't need to wait for it to heal. Like I will write from the wound every day. I would, you know, when I would dance or perform, like just right from that vein, like I just, I don't have it in me. I don't have the energy to, to wait until I heal before I, <laughs> before I start creating something. And mm. it's, you know, sometimes it's hurtful when somebody reads your book and they pick out something that was very personal to you. And they're like, I just hated this or that part wasn't believable. And I'm like, Oh, that mm. part was actually like my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, trust me when I say that part was real. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I could imagine that. I just, um, I, so did you include the social media aspect because of your feeling toward it? Maybe. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, I think especially in the past year and a half since COVID, and, and even before that, I think so much of who we are right now is social media dependent, especially as artists, as authors, as anything. Like, it's so much of our life is building a brand and being something that that people can connect with. And I guess I'm I'm very lucky. My brand, quote unquote, is just my personality. Like, it's just. I try very hard to just be completely honest and, you know, weird sometimes, not weird other times, resting bitch face all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Not worried I'm, about it. <laughs> that's a good title, resting bitch face all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go on, I just wrote something yesterday where I was talking about how tango is my favorite dance because I'm naturally frowny faced and I refer to myself as having resting tango face. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, it's even nicer, right? It is no, nicer. I, well, you know, I, so did you see yourself being a writer, like, years before? Like, because this is fairly new, recent. Yeah. I mean, I always, I always wrote ever since I was little. Most of it was, like, a lot of poetry. I wrote a lot of poetry for many years. And some short stories that were, you know, admittedly, God awful and terrible. Like, cause I thought I was being edgy when I was just like, Oh, I'm going to write this story. But from like the point of view of the, like the sexual predator, like nobody wants to read that, you know, especially like I was like 18 thinking like that was cool. Um, and I, I wrote a, a independent comic book for a little while. So I always wrote, but then somewhere along the way I lost my confidence and stopped writing. And I kept telling myself, you know, oh, that's just not something you'll ever do. It's not something you'll ever do. You can't write a book. Like, who are you kidding? And one day I just got very tired of telling myself I couldn't do it. And I sat down and thought, yeah, maybe I'll try to write this, this one idea that I've been playing with for, you know, 20 years in my head. And that was my first book. That was Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent. That's this is your uh, Pretty Ugly is your second book. No, Pretty Ugly is my fourth. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, that's I have a, yeah. I have oh, a so two it's books. Recent. It's, a, it's a recent part of your life, but it's, you've been very prolific. Yeah. What, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and, and I think people are like, oh, gosh, you're so prolific. But my second and third books, it, it, that's actually like one book. I, okay. yeah, I consider it one book. It's like a two-part thing. But, oh, okay. you know, when, when you're like indie published, like sometimes it's about like, pumping out books fast, which yeah. I'm like, but I, I really can't do that. It's not sustainable. I just, by the time my first book came out, I already had a lot of stuff finished. Got it. Well, what are the titles of the second and third one? Uh, the second book is called From Daylight to Madness. Okay. And the third book is called When the Sleeping Dead Still Talk. And those okay. are both um, like Victorian era gothic horror like mental institution type of oh wow and you're just like upbeat laugh I love your um, <laughs> God. <laughs> I love your titles they're all really poetic oh yeah so those three beautiful frightening and silent 
From Daylight to Madness, From the Sleeping Dead Still Talk, those were all actual lines from poems that I wrote. Oh, very nice. Okay. That ended up, like, thematically working their way into the, into the novels. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. And Pretty Ugly is a great title also. Yes. It's, you know, it's, it's the right title for this book. <laughs> oh, excellent. When you, when you go back and look at the earlier books, do, do you think you could have ever um, written them now again? I mean that, like, um, how would they be different if you were to write them now? Oh, um, you know, I don't, they would just like, they'd be cleaner, I would say. I think, you know, like as, as authors, you just like, you polish your craft as you go. So I think some of the, just like structurally, they would be cleaner, but I wouldn't change any of them emotionally at all. I think Mm -hmm. they told the story that I, I always wanted to tell. Like in Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, which was my first book, the one that um, it won the Kindle Award for Best Horror of 2020. It, you know, that was like my dream book. It really, it took me, it lived in my head for 20 years. I tried to write it as a three-person play. I tried to write it as a graphic novel. Nothing worked, um, but it works as a novel. And oh, wow. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. I, I don't like to think about like changing things. It, it exists in the universe, and it's a snapshot of who I was when I was writing them. So I, I wouldn't write them differently. I would write them more, like, cleaned up a little, like, grammatically. Like, right now I'm obsessed with using M dashes, so I would probably, mm-hmm. like, go back and change all of the, like, commas to M dashes, and that's, mm-hmm. that wouldn't help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it's, so do you find that a real por- important aspect for you? Like, the, you know, the technique, the grammar, all the... Um, technical parts of writing, or is it still about the story? Um, it's still about the story. I mean, I know I should care more about the grammar parts and all the technical parts, but to me, it is, it's the story, it's the characters. It's, I do love language. I love, like, molding language like it's clay. You know, I just making it take different shapes. I'm still, you know, I'm a poet at heart. So there's a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, lyrical language. And there's a rhythm to the way I write with word repetitions and sentence lengths. And so. Hmm. And what's the underlying theme? Like if someone takes home your book and reads it, besides the, the, the story itself, do you have something you want them to take away or think about? Besides the story? Um, I think, honestly, the, the work, I think my, my overreaching theme would actually be grief and grief writing and how grief affects our lives. And it's not even just necessarily like current grief. Like it's, it's just like how it shapes us. And because like, Grief is like a, a tidal wave that can come and bowl you over, but it's also like a, a street with a lot of potholes in it. Sometimes it's like a, you know, a story told by a schizophrenic. It doesn't make any sense. It's just so, yeah, I would say that everything I write is kind of an exploration of grief in some way, shape, or form. And, and grief is a, doesn't necessarily mean like death because you can grieve anything. You can grieve you know, losing a job or you can grieve the fact that you're heavier now than you were five years ago. You can grieve your body changing. You can grieve a, a, a life that you didn't live. So, hmm. yeah, I'm Eric, Eric, Eric has to <laughs> grieve when they cancel the color of lipstick. That is his favorite, <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's, it's not over yet. It's, uh, that's the day to day. That's the grief you live with always. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I've been wearing the same color lipstick since I was in high school, so not, and I'm always paranoid that they're going to discontinue it. Oh wow! Yeah. And Al, Al I knows what he speaks. Yeah. Just like, and I would die. The worst like, thing in the worst thing in the world for a woman is to go to get her lipstick, and they've discontinued it. Oh wow! Or for me, as being a curly haired woman, like um, finding the right products to like deal with my hair is a lifelong battle and when they discontinue one of my hair products that it's it's like 
it's like an eight month process to like figure mm-hmm. out a new combination of conditioners and things that somehow fix the curly hair. Oh wow! <laughs> no, it, it happens to me all the time. Yeah, <laughs> Al has a nice Al has a nice full head of curly hair. Yeah, everybody everybody thinks he's Jewish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They, that's what they, wow. So it sounds pretty deep. How does, how does, like when you go into a book like this and you did pretty ugly at the end of it, like, you know, so you put it out and um, how has this changed you, do you think, or is it too soon to tell? Um, I think it might be too soon to tell. I feel, I feel like, I miss my characters so much when I stop writing them and I always have to take like a mental break because I I don't know who I am without them for a little while. So I can't like go right into another project, Mm -hmm. but I think, I think pretty ugly changed me because I, I feel like it brought out a less cynical side of me. And there's like a, a strange romanticism in Pretty Ugly that that I just I didn't I wasn't accessing that part of my emotions and my brain. Mm. And oh. I guess like believing in self forgiveness, like it was all, all of that. <laughs> Humans are pretty complicated, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, screwed up. <laughs> well, yeah, because, you know, my dogs just kind of go about each day as it's a new day and put the past in the past. You know, it's kind of it, – it, I, I love my dogs because they um, take me back to now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. they they're back. just present. They're just... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about now. It's not about what happened yesterday or what ha- it's going to happen tomorrow. It's about, well, let's, let's play with that ball now. Yeah. You know. yeah. yeah, but they they also have no goddamn responsibilities. Come on. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be pretty happy. If, uh... You provide the food. Come on. You yeah. provide the food. So you pet them. Like, yeah. Toys. Yeah. Let's yeah. not and aggrandize then... them for heaven's sake. Yeah, but uh, but you know, it's still. Uh, <laughs> I I find it it's it's just interesting how how deep it goes. So where do you go from here? Um, so I am working on a project now that I cannot talk about. Oh, she'd so, tell you, but she'd have to kill you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I, I will say it's not a horror novel. So oh, I guess I could say that. It's like my, my first time not writing horror. It's still dark, but <laughs> it's not it's not horror related. Um, so I'm about 60,000 words into a, a total vomit first draft. Mm-hmm. And, awesome. but, what's the yeah. time frame on something like that how do you do you have one or is it can you sit yourself down and force yourself to write kind of in time or um i can but i don't like to because I, I, I I'll, I'll always rebel against that if i'm like i have to do a thousand words a day you know i i can't i can't do that that's not how i work i will mm. say the time frame for the book i'm writing right now that i can't talk about um, my agent, not Mickey, my publicist, but my agent did say, write it and write it fast mm. because she thought the idea was like a hot idea. Oh, nice. So this is, this is probably like one of the fastest times I've written. But I also think my drafting process is going to take a lot longer because I didn't go into this project with like a huge mental well <laughs> of understanding who these characters were. So I'm figuring them out as I on the fly, like as I'm typing, figuring out, you know, a whole different genre to be writing in. And How does that feel? Does that, does um, it change your mind? You know? it's, it's liberating. And, but also it's hard for me not to go back to like kind of horror tropes and things like that, because I love them so much. <laughs> and I, I keep thinking like, I should just add, like, a ghost in here. I'm like, no, don't add a ghost. That that wouldn't even make sense. Um, But so it's, you know, when the writing's going well, and I think this is the same for, like, any project, when the writing's going well, it feels great. And then there's days where you just don't have words. Like, they're just not there. Yeah, yeah. 
story of my life. <laughs> uh, well, um, it, it was uh, pretty amazing. So now uh, let's talk about where people find Jennifer Ann Gordon. Oh, the easiest place to find Jennifer Ann Gordon is actually at jenniferangordon.com, my website. That has links to all of my social media, so you can choose where to benevolently stalk me. I'm not on Twitter a lot because it gives me, like, rage-induced panic attacks. Yeah. Uh, So uh, I do have a Twitter account, but don't expect anything from it, really, except the occasional retweet of a meme. Uh, But I am active on Instagram. If you like dogs, follow me on Instagram Mm -hmm. because I take a lot of pictures of my dog. And uh, But, again, mostly active on Facebook. Well, great. Now, we're going to have you uh, linked up to our webpage as well. People listening can find yeah. you real easy then. and um, If they yeah. want to, after all this talk. Oh, I really <laughs> like that. That girl is cray cray. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how it is. So, <laughs> does, does your pandemic in your book, um, does it end? Or your virus? No. No. Um, <laughs> Do they have no. Q on? In? Is there like Q, on, Q there or is it R? Or <laughs> no. <S? laughs> Maybe a V. <laughs> no. <laughs> no V group. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. well, there you go. <laughs> well, our guest has been the great Jennifer Ann Gordon, and the new book is pretty ugly. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Thanks, Alan. Jennifer. Thank you, Eric. It was great. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! How dare you? If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This is Peter. Of something with media.